Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Xia Xuan from uh, Science Advisory Team and I will be the moderator for today's session. Um, joining us today is none other than our founder and CEO, Drew. Drew, if you'd like to unveil yourself. Hello, Xia Xuan. <laughs> Nice to see you. And uh, Drew will be uh, giving us a performance uh, review on the various uh, size portfolios, uh, how we did in quarter two, and um, perhaps as well as a sneak peek into what clients can actually expect from size moving forward as we celebrate our second year anniversary. Um, feel free to raise any questions along the way via the Q&A box and we'll be taking some pauses during the presentations to address them. Um, without further ado, let me now hand this over to the man behind the magic. Um, over to you, Drew. Thank you, Jajan, for um, a very nice and kind intro. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this uh, Thursday um, for our webinar. Um, I am doing this from my partner's room, so you are probably missing our <laughs> two my, my two favorite uh, pictures which are the behind of my screen, but, but they'll be back soon, I promise. Uh, but without wasting much time, um, let's get into it. So Q2, how was it? So I think one thing that's obviously been very interesting, and I think one very positive development is, um, especially if you at least look at the US markets, and we'll talk a bit more of the other markets, uh, the number of cases obviously have started coming down uh, significantly. And you can see there's also a nice little correlation that's coming in drafting with alongside the number of vaccinations, which is on the right. Um, at the time when we took this thing, almost you know half of, uh, of the population that's almost about 170 million odd people have received uh, the first dose um, as far as the US is concerned, right? Uh, but this thing is not just you know specific to US. In fact, uh, if you look across the board, uh, including some of the other developed uh, countries and even here uh, within you know Singapore, as you know, now there's been a fast track uh, you know plan to actually get vaccines. I had my first uh, jab last week, and you know we had the next one in about four weeks from now. Uh, there was obviously some scares which had come in. You remember that little situation in India uh, back uh, in March and April, which was very, very scary. But as you can see, you know, um, in many ways, in majority of economies across the world, um, the worst is behind us. And I think this is also panning up with the faster rollout of vaccines um, that are happening um, across the nations. Um, this is a chart again, you know, you can see uh, where the numbers are and, you know, even India, which was very slow, I think we had about 2% is now close to 20%. Uh, but across, you know, if you look uh, Europe, across US, across Canada, many of these markets uh, that the rate at which the vaccines are getting rolled out is somewhere between, you know, 40 to 60% out, right? And this is very powerful because, uh, you know, at least as soon as you start getting your first dose, um, there's a very almost a set pattern when you'll get your second dose and in fact there's also a study that says that at first dose itself your probability of getting the you know um, the virus itself reduces in many ways now very like you know aligned with that just as what's been happening in terms of the cases themselves reducing in some ways and the vaccines getting rolled out the markets are actually reacting very, very favorably to it, right? Uh, in fact, if you look, uh, you know, the rally which started, I would say, probably around Q2 last year, uh, which many people said that, hey, this is going to be something that's short-lived. In fact, there was some kind of correction and scares that happened um, out in, in the first quarter of this year as well, actually carried on. And the sector and the space uniformly did extremely, extremely well. Uh, S&P, obviously, every day, you know, we, we say that it's a new high, it's a new high, it's a new high. Uh, and as you can see, it's, you know, it's, it's inching towards the 40, 4500 level, as, as we can see on this chart, um, it probably will be happening within this quarter. Now, this uh, phenomenon, if you think, right, is actually not just limited to the US. If you look across the world, a very, very high correlation, you can see, you know, you look at uh, Europe, you look at UK, you look at France, almost everywhere, you know, you can see that kind of from, from late last year till now, there is that positive, positive, you know, momentum, which is actually continuing in these markets. I think the only exception to that rule uh, is China. And this has nothing to do with, of course, any kind of vaccine rollouts or anything of that sort. Uh, as you know, there has always been a lot more scrutiny on uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, the tech players coming from the government. In fact, uh, the most recent one that at least I remember was just after the listing, I think last week or so for, for Didi, which is like the Uber Grab equivalent um, in, in China, uh, the regulators actually said that, hey, you can't, you know, ban the apps from the different you know, app stores just from the version that you're collecting more data than you should. 
Um, this obviously has deeply impacted you know, Chinese tech plays. However, um, we personally are of the view that we live today in a day where you cannot live without tech. Of course, I think some of the things, the way they do are you know, debatable, but Didi is an essential part, just the way you know, uh, right hailing is very critical, uh, like an Uber is to the US or, or similar players uh, in, in, in Singapore. Uh, so, so our view is that though this kind of impact will you know, be around for maybe the next few weeks, next few months, I think in the long run, I think there is there's no doubt in our belief uh, in China as well as the Chinese tech place. And, and that's why they continue being a part of our, our core portfolios. And that's something that I will you know, touch on as we, as we get along with, uh, with this today. Right, um, with that, um, I can see some questions rolling in, uh, Jajwin. Before we start covering our product, should we maybe stop to just take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, since we were on the market outlook part, um, there was this viewer who was actually asking whether or not do we actually foresee a correction coming in the end of the year? Mm. It's, uh, it's anyone's guess, to be honest, right? Um, if you ask me that, will the market see a dip at some point in the next six months? I would want to say yes. But if you ask me that, mm. where we end up, you know, 12, 18 months from now, will that be lower or higher than where we are today? I would say... Uh, we will end up higher. Uh, and the reality for that is very simple. There is excessive capital in the world. You know, a lot of money has been printed. And one of the places that it comes is the equity markets. There's no doubt, there's no surprise in this. As bank yields keep on coming off, this is where people are chasing everything from returns to yield. I know some of them were in the crypto sphere, you know, so that rally, but a lot of that has been, you know, um, dissuaded, persuaded away, whatever is the right word. Um, my two cents are that we continue seeing uh, this move, this, this broader move up. There could be a correction which can come now and then, but I do not expect a massive, massive correction, uh, you know, uh, coming into place. I, I don't see any real factor to say that it can be something which will cause a 30% correction, let's say, in the markets, right? I think mm -hmm. today if we get a 5% correction, none of us must be surprised, but I always tell people, hey, if it's 5% corrected, also remember you're up 30%, right? So net-net, wh where do you stand in some ways? Mm, I agree with you. And actually, I think on that note, there has been quite a fair bit of a narrative going around with regards to uh, interest rates, right? So um, there was actually this um, viewer who is uh, asking, you know, uh, with regards to the backdrop of economic strength, um, as well as, you know, Fed talking about talking about paper ring, right? Yeah, <laughs> so um, how do you actually, you know, expect that to pan out, especially with regards to uh, sectors such as uh, banks and commodities, which tends to be a bit more cyclical in nature? Yeah, yeah. So is, is the question that where do I think banks and commodities head from here in some ways? Mm, yes. Yeah, I think uh, like linking up to the question, I guess, of course, of where interest rates are, right? Um, our view is that generally, um, we think that given the rates are so suppressed anyways, I think if I had to put a view, the view would be that rates should, you know, make a move up. I think what happened in March or in Feb, which was a bit of a anomalous spike, so as to say, uh, but over time, if I look forward like one or two years, would I expect rates to move up gradually? I would, I would, right? And there, depending on how the, you know, economic condition is, there will always be two sides of the coin, no matter which setup you look at. Um, if you look at uh, the fact that banking sectors, oh, if the rates are up, do they actually make less money? Yes, they probably make less money because they have to give out higher rates. But the other school of thought, of course, is that if the rates are going up, the economy is doing well, and there is going to be a much more positive. So generally, I think I would align that it's actually going to be favorable as, mm. as you know, the rates go up. I think um, as far as commodities themselves are concerned, uh, uh, interest rates and commodities, you know, I mean, I think the correlation is, is well... Uh, well known. Uh, the bigger question, I guess, comes in what does it mean in this kind of an economic outlook? Mm -hmm. I think what has been very interesting is that a lot of people expected gold to be that, you know, perfect kind of hedge, mm -hmm. uh, which actually is not really panning out in terms of, you know, how, how things are. Uh, so I think having a bit of a commodity exposure within your portfolios is good. Uh, but I don't see a strong reason to go massively overboard in that sector. And that's why, in fact, even if you look uh, in our portfolios, and again, I'm sharing my views, but our decisions are completely data-based. Um, the allocation caps for, you know, gold somewhere, even in the, you know, in where it's high, it, it does not really cross above 10% for, for that reason. Right. 
And uh, moving on to the next question, I mean, we touch on equities, we touch on bonds, but you know, obviously, we need to go into meme stocks, right? That has been trending, you know, <laughs> for the last one year. Yeah. So, um, what would you actually, you know, think of the rise of a meme stock and then um, its um, disconnection with fundamentals? Yeah. Um, does that actually affect um, size investment strategy going forward? Yeah. Uh, so the does it in fact? Uh, so so two questions like what do I think of meme stocks and how does it impact mm. our strategy? Um, so first part, I think meme stocks are, you know, they are one of the best examples of you know beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder in some ways, <laughs> right? Uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, we had the lays, uh, you know, those scripts, and uh, they used to have these things called dazos. I don't know if people ever remember those little things that you can play around with. And people would just keep on buying a lot of these lace packets so that they can collect these tazos. It was a great, you know, marketing strategy because you buy this packet of crisps for one dollar, but what you're really buying it is for the tazo, which costs like five cents. But you, because only they have it, you buy it. I think a lot of what you're seeing in the meme world is a lot what you would say is momentum and you know Reddit community and so on and so forth. Mm. I don't think it's a sustainable way to make money. I would want to believe and like with all of these things, there will more people who will lose money. Then make money in this, in the grander scheme mm -hmm. of things. Um, having said that, uh, at the end of the day, as long as you have your core portfolios, uh, you know, in place, you have your fundamentals in place, which, in my view, should be somewhere between, you know, anything between where you're in life, between seventy to maybe ninety percent of your portfolio. Uh, if the balance, this is what you want to do, do it. But mentally, be prepared that getting into a meme stock is no different than getting into crypto in some ways, at least as far as the volatility is concerned. And um, you should be prepared that this is something which can, you know, completely, you know, wipe off. Uh, which comes to the second question, which is, does it change our strategy? Now, mm -hmm. as a prudent manager, there is nothing which justifies us buying it, right? We, based on data, on historical data, these are factors which, you know, they change overnight on news, mm -hmm. on communities. They will not be part of our portfolios, right? If a small index somewhere is tracking it, it might have some allocation. Uh, but that allocation for your entire portfolio in, in our world will not be more than, I don't know, 0.1%. <laughs> that is the amount of conviction we have on that. Um, can you make money in it? Yes. But our views, you can lose a lot also. And I think when you come into platforms like us, it's a lot about long-term, you know, sustainable wealth generation. And that is what our focus is. And if this is what you want to do on your, you know, brokerage account on the site, you know, be my guest. But I would sincerely say that do it with a small portion of your net wealth because some things like this, historically have always end up in flames and you don't want to be betting your life on this. Sure. Okay, so let's move on to the last question before we move on to the next section. Huh? Sure. Okay, so it's actually with regards to our REITs portfolio. So what yeah. do you think, you know, um, will happen to the REITs portfolio, the impact of interest rates? Yeah. Okay, and whether or not it is actually, you know, negatively correlated to REITs. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a similar example, right? This question gets asked a lot. And by the way, it's a great question. It's a very, it's a very interesting question because the premise is that if interest rates rise up, then, you know, for REITs to actually expand or, you know, acquire, et cetera, it will become tougher for them to actually uh, borrow money, right? To fulfill their obligations because it'll be more expensive and so on and so forth. So that is, you're right, that is a negative, right? But the premise is that if the interest rates are rising, generally it means that the economy is, you know, you know, coming back on and people are moving back, you know, trying to spend, whether it's buying houses, buying offices, moving back to offices, et cetera, as the case might be. So that actually means that also gives uh, an opportunity for such players to, you know, uh, price at a much, much higher price than usual. And just to give an example, we moved into our new office um, and we were maybe just fortunate that we took it in January when we signed the contract. Um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, if it had come like March or, um, you know, April, the setup would be completely different. So we actually got no, no real significant discount despite this, oh shit, you know, interest rates are going up, rates are going to suffer and blah, blah. Because the reality is that at that time, the premise was, of course, things are going to get back to normal. And at least when coming back to our portfolio, with the vaccinations getting rolling out, you know, we will get to a more and more normal state. In fact, even in the ruling, I think, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, they said that oh, if you're vaccinated, you will be treated a bit differently. Like, you know, you can have more people going in the office, more people go out for dinners. So we expect that the vaccination people will adopt it. And because of that, generally, as a broader city, as a broader country, we will, you know, uh, come back to a more uh, normal state. So I think um, it's, it's gonna have 
overall a net positive impact. Uh, and, and I think that is why we still believe that that should be uh, a decent allocation uh, within your portfolio. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. So I think we'll take a pause on the Q&A first. We can move on to the next section. And then sure. after which we'll still have another Q&A section. All right. Let's do that. Um, so some of them we've actually covered, you know, uh, today, right? But just a recap because I, they could be some of the early, you know, customers or some new joiners on today's session. So we primarily have like, you know, four main products, right? Essentially starting from the least risk, which is the Scythe Cash Plus. This essentially is, I would say, if you don't know what to do with your money, but you're not happy with the five basis points return that you're getting uh, in your bank, this is what you do. Extremely low in risk uh, with the projected return of 1.5%. We'll actually be sharing some numbers that, hey, you guys say this, what do you guys really deliver, right? Um, the second one, I think, is the Cyfreed Plus, uh, one of our more popular products. I'm sure you've you know, heard about this uh, multiple places. This is the one that we build in very close collaboration uh, with SGX. Now, this product is particularly popular with customers looking for some sort of passive income. And at Singapore, we are very fortunate, as some of you might know, Singapore is Asia's second largest uh, REIT market, the first one being uh, Japan. Uh, the market cap of all the REITs combined is not of almost about $100 billion. So a great market, very liquid, and we are very fortunate, you know, like many markets, like even Hong Kong, etc., can't claim this. But if you're looking for passive income, REITs are great, uh, giving yield of about, you know, uh, four to five percent uh, on average. And then lastly, we come on our investment portfolios, uh, which start from, you know, uh, the, the defensive balance growth and then equity 100. Uh, essentially, these consist of equities, bonds, and gold. Uh, equity 100, as the name suggests, is 100% equities. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, along with some of the factors, and I will come to it when, you know, we talk about the core offering itself, uh, we also have exposure to China and China tech, which makes it a very, very unique, you know, uh, product in its own regard. Uh, this is a relatively stable product. And depending on your risk appetite, um, you know, the equity allocation increases from, from left uh, to right, uh, which also means that uh, when you come on a defensive portfolio, you will see more allocation to bonds and gold, uh, which decreases and actually becomes zero as you move uh, towards uh, the equity hundred, something we'll cover in our, in our forthcoming slides. All right, which brings us to our first poll question. Jajun, you wanna take it away? Yep, so uh, we like our viewers to take part in this poll. Um, which portfolio are you guys most interested in? So um, for myself, I actually like Equity 100 personally. So um, reason is because uh, I like that, you know, it's diversified. It gives me uh, exposure to um, US, China, as well as, the, you know, um, it is optimized in such a way that it brings down the overall portfolio volatility, right? You know, by having some consumer stables, ETF, etc. So um, I find it as a very good foundation to my overall investment portfolio. Yeah, so personally, I, I like Equity Hunt. But, you know, host and panelists cannot vote. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what you, about you, Drew? You, you might, might, have, might have biased a little bit of uh, audience judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to follow what Josh and follows, right? I'm going yeah, to get stuck but, on equity 100, right? So, yeah. Okay. I want to see what the audience says. I, I, have a, I have my answers. Don't worry. I won't change my answers. Mm, okay. All right. We see All right. Our answers. Okay. okay. I think I have some influence over here. 43%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. I would say in a normal, in a normal scenario, I, I, you know, I would, I would, I would 100% say equity 100. I think it's, it's that setup where, we are like obviously diversified. It's global. I love the fact that we have China exposure. I especially feel now that given that China has really come off, I think it's it's a great idea to actually you know um, add some more. In fact, I just talked up day four yesterday my equity hundred portfolio. Me too. Uh, so, <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I mean, this is a long term play for us, right? Yeah. So, so why not? But I think uh, one thing that I'm conscious of that I don't want to decrease my you know read plus allocation. I would say not below, I would say, you know, 30 to 40 percent of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that, you know, REITs, of course, have done well, but I just feel and historically you've seen when equity markets rally, you know, because that's the easiest way to deploy capital. Normally, when it comes to start chasing assets and, you know, what better place than, you know, real estate. Right. And mm -hmm. some extent of it you were seeing. Right. I mean, despite all this. I mean, at least residential real estate in Singapore is at like an all time, all time high or something. Right. It's, it's just it's like rallying one after the other. So. I would say probably I'm a, I'm a 60, 40 equity, 100 uh, read kind of a person. So 
That's yeah. where I am right now. Yeah. In fact, actually, I do think that they are invested in different opportunity sets, right? So it doesn't yeah. mean that Equity 100, um, it's superior to REITs, for example, right? So um, I, I do think that if, let's say, you are trying to, you know, get a different set of exposure, something that is not too expensive because of this pandemic, definitely, you know, it's yeah. good to have some exposure into that as well. Yeah, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Good. All right. So let's do a quick, uh, you know, product overview where we'll try to go over these, you know, uh, three per four products that we've spoken about. Uh, and then, you know, we'll maybe pause for a few questions. So Saif Cash Plus, very simple, just as the name suggests, earn up to 1.5% projected uh, return. Um, essentially, what we do is we essentially invest in a series of money market funds, uh, bonds and and some in largely I would say you know um, what you will call like government bonds, uh, but also some investment grade bonds such as companies like Standard Chartered etc. Uh, to get you a blended yield of roughly about 1.5 percent. Now, what is very interesting in this part is there is daily accrual of returns, so you get to see exactly what you're getting when you're getting. You can easily move you know between any portfolio. So if you want to move from an investment portfolio to cash plus or vice versa, it's it's very easy. There is no minimum amount there is no limits and there is no lockup period, right? And it's, it's exactly like there is, the, the cost of doing this is absolutely free. The, this product is absolutely free. This is for those who just want to experience like what it can be investing in a very low risk, I would say investment product. Uh, but you know, you can put in your money, you can withdraw it. And I think something that a lot of our customers do is to set up this automatic recurring uh, transfers because I think a lot of people like to DCA, especially I think into equity hundred and also, also, also plus that matter, uh, but, they feel they, they should be like, so even if they might have $100,000 to invest, they would like not to, you know, do it at this one point. They would like to break it up across, let's say, the next year. And what they do is they'll put that money in cash press and then set up like 10 deposits. So automatically it just works, works really well and actually quite, quite a cool feature that the team has built um, on our side. Uh, now, uh, there are some other products out there. I think the most notable, of course, is the saving bank account, which if you're lucky, you'll get five basis points. I think last one, I think they did a further rate cut and now I'm getting two basis points. So it's incredible. Uh, but if you look at some of the other, you know, competing, you know, uh, products out there, essentially you will see that the yield offering is somewhere between I don't know, 25 basis points to maybe 1.3% or so, uh, which makes it very attractive with Saif Cash Plus, uh, which actually is offering, you know, 1.5%. Uh, uh, there is no minimum, you know, uh, amounts that you need to place out here. Uh, essentially you can start with as little or as much as you want. We traditionally actually see people putting much larger amounts in cash plus just given the nature how safe and how you know uh, low risk option it is till you maybe find better use of the product whether within the site framework uh, or outside for that matter so the interesting question is you guys said 1.5 percent what do you guys really give so these are like exact numbers what you see for q2 you know 2020 the return was about point just under 0.3 percent the year to year return currently starts at 0.83% and the annualized return is at 1.66%. So if you see this projected return that we claim of 1.5%, the annualized return actually is, is actually slightly higher um, than that number. Um, and and this, is, this is one thing that I would like to highlight is that when there was that little you know, rate spikes, et cetera, you have that temporary dip you know, which happened in, in April, right? But if you look at the magnitude of that dip, if you just look at the scale on the left-hand side, that dip is basically just about 20 basis points or literally, you know, 0.2%, et cetera. So I know some people panicked and they withdrew, but, you know, for those who even stuck on for a couple of weeks, it does, you know, uh, revert back very, very quickly and it goes up. And the reason why it's very important to understand why, why, why should this revert back? It's very simple because as prudent fund managers, when you take a bond, the way how the bond works is they're supposed to give you a yield at maturity, right? So that's at when, after let's say one year, two years, whenever the bond matures, you are supposed to get your yield. If you simply just held it on, you know, till that last moment, you will get paid your, you know, one and a half, two percent, unless the bond just defaults. And that is something to be conscious of, like how often do you have bond defaults? That's extremely, extremely rare, especially in the quality of bonds that we are going in. And also with the diversification that's actually, you know, uh, coming into place, uh, that risk is always, always minimal. In fact, you know, I, I can't think of a single negative year per se, but there have been instances where you might see a little bit correction, but again, always keep in the grander scheme of things, it's too minimal that happens. But if you still invested for even a few weeks, you'll be well up on, on, on a very good path. And I think May and June both had very, very good returns. 
Cool. Moving on to our second product, the Saif Read Plus. Now, this obviously is a very, very unique product which we've built uh, alongside SGX. You know, we launched it last year, extremely popular. Uh, this is the first of its kind thing. It brings in a lot of really good aspects of investing into a product. Very popular. It's, it's actually quite a technology marvel also, how we can fractionalize and we can invest and we can, you know, auto reinvest your dividends, something that I will cover later. Very, very powerful tool. So how the index is created is we work alongside the best index creators at SGX uh, to track the largest, the most liquid REITs uh, within, within Singapore. Uh, obviously with the REITs, there's capital appreciation, but also the aspect of dividend yield, right? Uh, the Bloomberg estimates were about 5.1% for, for 2020. So very, very strong, right? And how we actually end up creating the REITs, right? I mean, and this is something we've course discussed with our counterparts at SGX. We look at free float, we, we look at weighted cap, we look at velocity. So we obviously ensure that there are certain factors and you know quality of the fund manager etc that is you know in place but also we we put a 10 percent cap for greater portfolio diversification now bear in mind uh this portfolio we, we rebalance twice a year so there could be instances where you might see something at like 11 or 12 percent or if there's a merger the capital land case where it might temporarily look much higher but over time the idea is always to bring it back in so there is not enough you know one exposure which is always such a good thing to have because diversification is a strength unless you have that strong view, strong fundamentals. And, and if you do, then, you know, you should go to a brokerage, open up, you know, definitely take that read, which you want, but otherwise getting that diversification is, is, is very, very important. And we've seen this in part, right? Uh, we saw it with, with, with high flux. We saw it with, uh, what was the read, which had ES, uh, ESR? Yes, I read, which struggled last year. So we've always seen this, that if you had all, you know, your eggs in one basket, right, uh, then essentially uh, it's it's a problem. But if you have a basket of diversified eggs, even if that means anything, but I, I think it brings the point across. If you have that diversification in place, it's actually very, very good. So, you know, be conscious when you build your portfolios and doing something like that. Uh, now we have two options. Uh, one, of course, is the 100% read portfolio very, very straightforward. But for those who are a bit more conservative, we do offer an optional risk management on uh, the REIT portfolio. Here, uh, when the markets are extremely volatile, we would sell some of the REITs and we would actually buy uh, the Singapore government bonds uh, to you know, elevate the impact. Now, of course, this does impact a bit on the yield which you will get, but it protects you a lot on the downside as well. Um, so let me show you with an example, you know, how that goes. Uh, but essentially, you know, when you have that little bit of correction that happens up in the read market because the news is bad here is there, you do have that upside that comes because of risk management. So this quickly uh, in the last quarter, risk management actually outperformed 1.2% in the span, uh, whereas 100% um, reads had about, you know, 0.59%. Uh, on the right, you can see the allocation. It's about, you know, 50-50 with the reads and bonds, give or take. And then of course, REITs 100 is 100% 100 yields. Now this is actually something which is powerful, right? Now this was drawn from, you know, beginning of, of last year, right? And I think I would try to put your attention on, on this section, right? Which is around in April. Now the advantage was if you go back here, there was obviously a very strong REIT allocation, which even happened with risks, REIT with risk management. I remember the allocation was almost close to about 70 odd percent, uh, which was in REIT plus. But through March, we actually sold the REITs and you know bought uh, the bonds in place. And what that led to was very important. If you can see April, your drawdown was significantly constrained. Your drawdown was like, whereas the conventional, I guess, straight 100% REIT product was almost down close to 20, 25%. The REIT with risk management was only down, you know, something close to about, I think, 12% or so. And that's very powerful because as, uh, you know, markets obviously recovered, um, this gave incentive for users to stay invested, right? And they did not withdraw and because they did not withdraw as actually the portfolio did well, uh, they actually, you know, came back and ended up being winners. Uh, but this is something, you know, which is a very user to user specific. If you believe you're someone who is a bit more averse to the downside as in losing less, then reach with risk management make a lot of sense. If you're investing for a longer duration where you want to maximize, you know, your chances of capital appreciation or the dividend yield, then 100% REITs becomes the right option uh, for you. If I quickly look down, 
uh, you can look at where the numbers are, right? Uh, on average, essentially, for a very long duration, as you will see, the 100% REIT portfolio does outperform. But in shorter duration, especially in volatile times, there's a possibility, especially if you look at the average for the last three years or last five years, uh, the, the REIT managed with the risk will actually slightly outperform in both cases, right? But again, you know, this is of the kind of duration you're looking. Um, this year, of course, with the way how the bonds have done, uh, essentially the 100% REIT has, you know, uh, done well. And these numbers are till, you know, June end, so, so fairly, fairly recent in, in many ways. Uh, should not be a surprise, but the 100% REIT obviously has a higher dividend yield because it has a higher REIT allocation per se. All right. Uh, and the last one, of course, you know, is the SIF, uh, you know, core portfolios, right, uh, which we obviously start with the equity 100 and then move on to the balance, uh, you know, uh, defensive and obviously the growth kind of portfolios. So the interesting part out here is that we look at a relatively stable asset allocation. This we rebalance once maximum twice a year. Um, all the big names on the right in one portfolio, everything from Amazon uh, to Tesla to, you know, to, to, to Tencent to Google, all of them, you know, at one place. Uh, so the increased China focus is definitely there. Very, very popular for those looking to DCA. The advantage is if you have only a few thousand dollars which you want to DCA every time, you really can't do it, right? I mean, with this is just too much effort. You know, are you going to pay few hundred dollars on buying Amazon? You really can't diversify. Um, it is it is very, very good way to actually build that broad diversification across the different underlyings. We almost cover close to about 1500 stocks, you know, uh, globally. Uh, and the one of the questions that gets asked is that how exactly is you know, uh, the portfolio made, uh, it's actually made using smart, smart beta factors, something that I will just touch on right now. So what essentially, um, you know, what, what exactly is basically factor based, you know, investing, right? Essentially, first and foremost, it's, it's rule based, right? It's quantitative. This is not going to be where myself or, you know, keep or some from our investment team will wake up one day and say, oh, China is good or growth is bad and so on and so forth. It's, it's actually, we set these rules. We, you know, essentially said, hey, these are the different factors we are looking at. What is the best way to optimize it, right? And the view is to actually outperform traditional, you know, the, the market cap benchmarks. Now, historically, the benchmarks are based purely on market cap. So that means that, hey, if, if US has a larger market cap than China, then US should have a larger, you know, weightage. But the reality is, is that the best benchmark? If you think of it, the growth in GDP for many economies, especially in Asia, is, is much higher compared to their, you know, market cap per se. And that market cap is, is catching up, something that we are trying to do, right? Um, and, and what we're trying to do in, in many ways is, is what we call, you know, uh, capture the risk premium. So the premise of, of all our portfolios and something that you will see is that we want to optimize the risk-based returns, right? I mean, purely looking at returns, is never going to be uh, easy. It's never going to be possible. But when we bring in the risk element and try to maximize the risk adjusted returns, I think that's where the magic starts happening. And that's something we see, see in our strategy. Now, the factors that we consider is growth and value. There was a heavy bias towards growth. It's still actually a factor. But then we obviously pulled a bit and added a bit of value, and especially as things were turning a bit to normal, a bit of cyclical nature which was coming in. Uh, we obviously uh, look at volatility. We prefer uh, typically low wall over high wall stocks, which is another reason why uh, GME, et cetera, might not you know, fit into our portfolios. And size, our preference is you know, large cap over, over small cap. We think over time, those kind of you know, become much stronger indicators of a company's success. And lastly, of course, we've just started adding a country factor in, uh, which currently obviously sees which is the reason of, you know, the reason why uh, we have China uh, into the setup. Now, how, how have we done? Now, just in the last, you know, um, a quarter, as you can see across our portfolios, right from, you know, defensive balance growth, you can see the performance has been somewhere between three to five percent. I think it's very, it's very impressive for a diversified portfolio uh, in this short duration. Uh, of course, you know, intuitively, I think one question would be, hey, equity 100, 100 percent equity, this should really outperform. One of the reasons why this has not really outperformed some of the other things is because of China focus. But this is something that I will tell again, and I'm sure we've been here three months and six months. Unless you fundamentally believe that China is not a story which you want to, you know, play. In that case, I think this is where, you know, okay, this is maybe not the right portfolio for you. But these kind of things that are happening in China uh, to us are actually blips and actually perform, uh, you know, buying opportunity. In fact, um, I would say that in the last maybe two months running, I think these portfolios, the core portfolio, especially those towards growth and equity 100 are probably our most popular products for that very reason, as many customers are finding essentially this as some sort of, uh, you know, a, a buying opportunity. 
but hey, still, we are all positive, right? So, you know, it's, it's still good. Great. Uh, before how to start, I will like to stop. And for any questions, back to you, Jajun. See a bunch of questions rolling in. Yes. Thanks for the pause. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I think we have uh, really quite a fair bit of uh, questions. Um, so I think, you know, the first question up on my list would be any plans to come to Malaysia? Oh, okay. Well, is that, is that <laughs> I, I think you're the best person to answer this question. <laughs> right? I, I couldn't really answer that in a Q&A section. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it for travel purposes or for Saif? Because I would love to travel if I could do Malaysia. <laughs> Uh, but if it's to Saif, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, always, you know, companies are looking at what mm. the different options uh, and the different, we are, of course, expanding. We will share in some time some of the markets that we are looking at. Uh, but having said that, we do have a very large number of customers from Malaysia already. Um, we have, you can sign up from Malaysia and, and transfer funds, you know, using some good tools like TransferWise, et cetera, uh, either in USD or SGD and benefit from, 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 from our offerings. And a lot of customers running into thousands and thousands are already doing it uh, from mm -hmm. Malaysia. Uh, so, you know, feel free to, you know, sign up. Uh, it should not make a, it should not hold you back. We should not hold you back. So, you know, mm -hmm. start today and tomorrow if we launch Malaysia, then, you know, you can always, you know, close this and, you know, open up your <laughs> account with Saif in Malaysia. Cool. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, so we, we saw that, you know, um, the Chinese stocks have been written down quite a fair bit. So yeah. uh, I think earlier on, you shared a bit on your outlook with regards to China. Yeah. But um, in our next rebalancing, do you think that this is an area that we can potentially increase our allocation to? Yeah, I think we've given China a fair amount of weight um, already, unless mm. there is a significant correction, which just fundamentally decreases the weight of China, right, on a massive amount, that's a different story. Uh, but mm. currently, I think this is an area where our allocations are, in a way, optimized for having enough China exposure. I think uh, our next rebalance is about three months due. I think a lot would happen then. Uh, but sometime before that, we will, we will review it. My hunch is that it's a bit unlikely, but a lot could change between now and the next three months. And that's something that, uh, you know, we'll only know closer to time. Right. Oh, okay. A viewer just congratulated us on Tulia's birthday. It's uh, it's about it's still about ten days away. <laughs> but, but thank you, thank you. I think we've uh, we we do finish it uh, on uh, next Saturday, so about about mm. two days away. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe moving on to the next question is with regards to um having some exposures into disruptive technologies, uh, such as the ARC ETF. Is that yeah. something that we are looking at? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, we have some offerings available for our, you know, um, AI kind of customers, uh, mm -hmm. which are actually already showing this offer. So if you are an AI customer, definitely reach out to, uh, you know, our, our, our wealth advisors, They'll, you'll see this private wealth page, uh, where some of these offerings are in place. Uh, I think um, they are still relatively high volatility. And that is something which is uh, probably kind of slightly goes against our desire for low wall. Uh, we are exploring it. I, I don't see it becoming part of our core offerings, if you ask me, uh, but we will potentially have ways uh, for you to access it through maybe some of the other products that we are thinking. And if you're an AI customer, you can reach to our private wealth uh, you know, uh, page right away and, and we can implement solutions uh, customized to your use case. Right. Okay, um, the next question that I have from a couple of viewers uh, is uh, with regards to CPF and SRS. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that has been uh, quite a common question <laughs> yeah. from our viewers. No, I know. Yeah. Mm. No, I know. It's, uh, so we've been, of course, you know, I think, uh, I think, so two parts of it, right? I think SRS is definitely something that we are trying for. Uh, I think it's, it's got its, uh, its value in some ways uh, because, uh, you know, uh, tax benefits, tax breaks, et cetera, that start coming in. Uh, there have been, I, I, as from what last I understand, there have been some, you know, considerations about how to rewarm the process on the MOF side. And that's something that we are working with, you know, the banks to figure out what's the best way. Uh, so I'm optimistic that SRS will happen. Um, it's taking longer. I mean, nothing's, it's, we are not holding back. It's some circumstances. Mm. Um, CPF, personally, I have a bit of a mixed opinion. I feel, I feel two and a half percent is great. I feel generally uh, it's a part of your, you know, wealth which is kept for retirement purposes for long term i majority of the customers uh, cpf is only a part of their you know entire i guess 
uh, you know, portfolio in some ways. So if I think of that, like my bond portfolio, which is what at least I would do, right? Um, I think that is something which which I quite like to do. And with the rest, I, you know, invest out in different solutions. So should I really tinker that two and a half percent? I mean, if anything tells me that, hey, this is a portfolio which will give you two and a half percent guaranteed, uh, you know, backed by the government, et cetera, I think, I think I, it, it's a no brainer. I wouldn't do it for, you know, all my wealth. Uh, but at least a part of my wealth, right? And for majority of people, this this amount might only be anything between you know five to maybe you know fifteen twenty percent of your net wealth. It's actually quite a good allocation. So from from that view, we are a big a bit mixed. Like should even CPF be put an investment product option somewhere? Uh, we understand some users do value it. Um, so so we are considering it, but uh, it's not something that we probably will will work very immediately. To be honest. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let's move on to the uh, next question. Uh. Okay, so it's with regards to the uh, FX conversion. So most of the portfolios like Core and Equity 100, we are buying into US listed ETFs, right? So yeah. how do we actually handle the FX part? Yeah, great, great question, right? So because we are technically like ourselves an institution, uh, we have negotiated an incredible uh, rate uh, with, with our FX broker of just about, I think, eight or nine basis points. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, log on to any of your, you know, DBS or any kind of banking apps and try to convert USD to SGD or vice versa. And you'll probably be skimmed by like, I don't know, if you're, if you're lucky, you know, probably, you know, 50 basis points, which is half a percent. If you're unlucky, like we saw one of the banks out here, it was almost 2%. So we literally, because um, we are able to, you know, uh, aggregate the entire FX that we mm -hmm. say, we actually get very preferential rates and that is exactly the rate which we pass out. I can I can pretty much assure you there is no platform that you can do this for it's at a cheaper rate than us, right? And if you can then do that and move across USD because we do take USD investments, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's a very, very attractive uh, setup and we understand FX, FX you know, it's, it's a joke when people have to pay 2% FX to, you know, invest in product that is going to give 2%, right? And and that, that's not something which we want to do at SAIF. Mm, sure, thanks for that. Okay, so let's uh, take in one more question first, and then we can cover the last part. Um, so actually, a couple of our viewers have pointed out that we didn't really cover the uh, global ARI portfolio yeah. today. So yeah. um, any reasons and whether or not you know this is a portfolio still worth considering? Yeah, so the, the reason, uh, so we didn't cover it because uh, for us, like the ARI is, is targeted more at customers who are looking uh, massively, I guess, on, on, I guess, downside protection, right? Mm -hmm. So we realize if you're giving a performance update, performance in a market where you're looking at, I guess, returns of certain benchmarks, uh, and then talking about downside protection does not really, you know, add up, right? Uh, so that's the reason why we did not actually cover it today. Now, whether it makes sense investing is I would always say it makes sense investing if your premise is largely on the aspect of, uh, not losing right if your if your main goal is that i want to protect my downside i don't want to lose then i think the ai is the right product for you uh, if you are somehow on the other school of thought that hey listen i'm mentally prepared there could be some blips i realize my portfolio could lose some value but i'm here you know for a very long term and a long horizon of investing uh, then you know probably it might not be the best option for you my suggestion would be one of the core offerings are probably better better suited for it so but that's that's the way how i would think about whether you should consider ARI or not in your portfolio offerings. Hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, you want to cover the last part first and then we yeah. can keep the rest sure. of the Yeah. Sure, sure. Let's do that. Hmm. All right. Uh, just give me one second. All these questions and it's getting a little warm in here. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, all right, let's get to the last section of it. So how do we start? Um, very simple, uh, you know, we can look at portfolios as a recommendation tool. Um, you can look at the different forecasts, very popular. You can put in you know, different amounts, see if you put something which is lump sum, put a monthly amount, how do these numbers change? And uh, if you can see in the middle of, you know, uh, the, the, these three options, it actually shows you what is the, you know, likely uh, the optimistic and the pessimistic kind of case, right? So almost to give you a range, what can you expect in a good or bad case scenario? Because we have to be prepared. There could be a bad case scenario also. Over a long time, of course, we do realize that things, you know, are more positive uh, than, than negative. Uh, and thereafter, there's a beautiful app, which is both on, you know, App Store and, and Google. And you can, you know, easy monitoring. You can look at your returns. You can manage funds. You can you know, uh, add portfolios, uh, move between portfolios, set up recurring from your cash plus, 
everything, right? Very, very easy to do. And majority of our users now are on the app itself. Uh, what is the fees it costs? Now, Cash Plus, as I mentioned, is completely, completely zero, right? I mean, there's nothing on Cash Plus, easiest way to start. Uh, but then across the different products, uh, the management fees from Blue to Platinum, right, which I was mentioning was the, the wealth kind of series, um, starts at, you know, 0.65 basis points and decreases to 0.35 basis points. Now, what is interesting out here is that this is across all your investment portfolio. So whether it's core, whether you're RE, whether you're equity 100, whether REIT plus, so it doesn't need to be like 100K in each of them for you to be gold. If you have 30K in RE and you know, 60K in, in equity and 10K in, in you know, um, a core balance, for example, you will still be considered um, a gold client. Uh, once you move to the black tier, uh, you have access to, to wealth experts on a regular basis. And for gold and platinum, you have a dedicated expert, like someone who will just be you know, monitoring your particular case, someone you can reach out to, to understand a bit more. Uh, about the different different kind of uh, you know products offering and how they might be suitable for you right now across you can see our fees pricing we said it starts from 0.35 goes up to 0.65 there is this is no trading fees there is no entry exit charges there is no minimum balance there is no minimums to start there is unlimited free withdrawals unlimited rebalancing between portfolios not like oh i'll charge you one percent because you sold one fund uh, you know bought the other ones and where we buy ETFs, like in many cases, we don't like read plus, we literally just go and buy the underlying reads, which is why it's such a good product. Um, whenever we do choose ETFs, one of the key criteria for us uh, to choose the right ETF is to choose like you know, the low ETF management fees. Uh, so those factors actually come into place when we build a portfolio for you to ensure your cost is minimal. Um, bear in mind, almost uniformly across the board, the ETF fees are significantly lower uh, than funds. Uh, purely because the way how they are structured is much more efficient. Uh, and that's a big reason why you're seeing this massive surge in ETF usage, uh, whereas you're seeing a bit more of decrease in, you know, active and funds, et cetera, as the case might be. Now, one question we get asked a lot is that, why should I use Saif and not just do it myself, right? Um, I would say that, you know, there are multiple reasons, right? But just to summarize, right? Firstly, if you ask me, my, my most important reason, I would say probably uh, is time. Uh, you know, if you do it through Saif, it's very straightforward, mindful. The DIY, you have to not do it several days, but they have to constantly monitor it. And then thereafter, re-monitor it and so on and so forth. But that's not all, right? I mean, there is nothing like minimum investment. You don't require a CDP and brokerage account. Um, and in our portfolios, you get everything such as risk management, uh, such as, you know, automated rebalance, uh, multiple offerings. Uh, you don't have to pay brokerage fees every time you transact. And the management fees is negligible. Like our management fees is lower than what many of these funds cost, you know, for, for, for just for the fund fees, you know, forget the things on top, right? But if you ask me, one of my second most favorite features is, is automatic dividend uh, reinvestment. And uh, maybe I'll spend like a minute on this and just tell you what that means. It's extremely powerful. What this means is that when you get paid a dividend, we actually reinvest that dividend. Now, think of REITs, for example, which on average give you 5% dividend. Historically, if you look at the return of the REIT portfolio, it's roughly sits in the 10% annualized range, right? If you get a 5% dividend, which you can reinvest, then you technically can get on a long term 10% on that 5%, which is 0.5%, right? Which basically is pretty much the fees of you partnering or entering with SAIF. Now, it is almost like a no brainer if you are interested in the REIT product, because this is something you can't do. If you build a portfolio of multiple, you know, REITs, when you, even if you have, I don't know, $100,000 invested, when you're going to get a dividend, it's going to be $200. Can you really go and buy something for $200? Yeah, maybe you can, but you'll probably end up paying $20 in brokerage, right? So this is the power of technology be able to fractionalize and then reinvest, and which is one of the reasons why this is a very good offering. Uh, but this does, is not only a function on REIT, this actually happens across portfolios. I think in REIT, the advantage is very, very popular. So, so I would say it's time, it's cost, and the ability to reinvest in a way, at least in certain products where it pays for the fees itself. And lastly, well, we do have a team of, you know, wealth experts, um, you know, just because we are digital, as we say, it doesn't mean no one's home. Um, our goal is not to actually tell you, uh, you know, uh, oh, buy this, sell this. That's not the intention of us. Um, 
the intention is more so that you can help understand our products better and see if they fit you know your goals and you know your desires uh, as you can see you know uh, jajwin who joined us today is also uh, one of our wealth experts and they can help you to better understand you know how our offerings are and how they fit uh, your use case um with that Yep. I think next my last slide off. is that, you know, we'll take some Q&A, but before we get there, join us next week to understand a bit more about uh, REITs, Perpetual Income okay, Generation, yeah. great topic for Singapore, and that'll be held by my colleague, Ritesh, uh, who heads our investment advisory team. Okay, cool. All right. Let's give a you. shout out to this fee waiver first. Oh, yeah. Why don't <laughs> go for it. Why don't, why don't you do it? I, I think if you can bias people for equity 100, you can probably bias them for opting for the fee waiver. Right. Earlier. Of course, right. I mean, like, you know, in this time and era, we are all very familiar with QR codes. And what is the best QR code out there is definitely for fee waiver, right? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So please scan this fee waiver. Thank you for joining us today. And then um, for this promo itself, you actually get six months fee waiver up to $30,000. Right? Okay, so um, let's move on to the Q&A section. Sure. Okay, yeah, so um, there's actually this viewer who is uh, asking uh, whether or not there are any plans for joint account and what will happen if, let's say, you know, the uh, single name account holder passes on. Yeah, so there is actually a provision like reach out to support uh, at SAIF and we can actually write you or maybe maybe uh, advisory at SAIF. There's an option which we can do and there is a particular set of form that we need to fill. And in case someone does pass out, then the next of kin, as the case might be, will be able to take over. Uh, by the way, even if you don't have this set up, there are mechanisms that you can still actually avail for this after but like with many things if you set it up earlier on it just is going to be a much smoother process so if you do want a joint account ownership structure uh, it is possible yeah mm, okay cool uh, moving on to the next question is with regards to withholding tax so i think this is also quite a common question faced yeah. by our viewers when they you know buy into us listed assets yeah uh, so uh, it's an interesting question. See, with holding tax, you have to pay irrespective, right? I mean, whether if you are in Singapore, you know, the thirty percent is really quite standard, right? If you're investing in US, but something which I'll tell you, which we do very interestingly, is that we try to optimize uh, for uh, the setups where um, we can minimize this. So I'll give you an example. In our portfolios, instead of SPY, we end up taking CSPX which is the UK listed line. And there the withholding is actually at 15%, right? Uh, rather than 30%. So it makes actually a lot of sense. However, there's a lot of misconfusion as to if something has a lower withholding tax, is it, it is always better. I'll give you an example. QQQ is a popular thing in our portfolios, which has a withholding tax of 30%. Uh, and there's a CQQQ line, which is I think in Europe, which is you know at 15%. But if you do one step deeper, you will realize CQQ has a higher, you know, expense ratio. So we just don't look at this. We will even look what is the net cost to you as a user and wherever possible, you will see us to completely optimize. So we will look at things which go beyond just purely looking at withholding tax. What is that net cost to you? And we realize in QQQ, it made a lot of sense to continue using the US line. But for example, in the case of, you know, SPY, uh, the CSP has actually made much more sense. So this is the advantage. You know, this is something that we constantly do and we constantly keep on, you know, working with the different ETF managers to ensure that the most optimal solutions are actually, you know, are given to you. Okay, sure. So um, if let's say, you know, today a client has a view that, okay, potentially um, US dollar may weaken. Right. And because uh, most of our ETFs are denominated in US dollars. Yeah. So how do we actually, you know, reconcile with this? Yeah. I mean, see, the thing is, yeah, that's a, the, the point is it's a, it's a, it's a very valid question, right? Um, mm. I think that if, if you do expect that the US dollar is definitely going to, you know, go down, then there are ways to like technically hedge your risk. Right. But I guess the, the view is always that if the US dollar is going to go down under what scenario is it going on? Is the broader economy actually recovering? Is it a setup where, you know, the asset classes are rising, right? We've had this correction in USD from the peaks as well. You go back the last 12 months, you will see the USD is at a, you know, we have lost money technically on Forex, but the gain in equity itself has been phenomenal. And, and in my view, if you're looking for a USD solution, somewhere you're looking for true diversification. If you're looking for true diversification, hedging it back to your currency might or might not be the best thing. Now, interestingly, I can tell you this because we have spent at least I would say, you know, three, three month durations in the course of last three years, looking at 
different forex hedging strategies and believe me i can tell you uniformly the common you know outcome has been unless you can perfectly time entry and exit you are bound to lose by hedging right mm -hmm. trust me hedging is super easy for us but it's actually a really really bad idea unless you are that fx guru who has a very strong view on different aspects right so think of it that i'm doing this because i generally want diversification think of it yes i might lose a little bit because of you know the forex risk but the net gain is absolutely you know going to more than justify it and you can look at over the last 10 years what you would have lost um, in forex you've probably made back in the last uh, you know 6 months yes yeah yeah Actually, I, I do think that, you know, we need to be looking at like, you know, the returns coming from the asset classes as well. Absolutely. So let's say, yeah. you know, the opportunities are outside of Singapore. And if you don't tap into that just because of like the fear of depreciating currency, then you're missing out a lot. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, before we actually move on to the next question, uh, maybe we can flash the uh, QR code again. So I sure. guess, you know, some viewers are asking for that. And I think I didn't give a proper shout out just now. Uh, this is only for new signups. Yeah. So, right, this is, this is you sign up, right? Oh no, hold on, hold on. This is a feedback form. Yeah, this is, I think this ah, is, a, okay. it's, only, it's only for new signups, yeah. It's only for new signups. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, new signups, cool. Okay, so um, the next question that I have over here, because uh, I think some of the questions are quite repetitive. Yeah. Okay, so perhaps, you know, uh, we, we will also be uploading a recording of this. So, you know, you, uh, our viewers can always check on that. Um, there's this uh, viewer who is asking whether or not does one actually needs to stay very updated with the news in order to minimize uh, any potential losses uh -huh. or how to know when to like, you know, cut loss or take profit. Any yeah. advice on that? No, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I would say, I mean, if like this is the whole reason why you have professionals like us, you know, if you look at our team, the pedigree, I mean, I'm from UBS. You know, we've got colleagues from Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, you name it, right? We've got every probably big bank uh, in, in the 100 odd, odd employees that we have at Cypher right now. Uh, the idea is this is what uh, a true wealth manager does for you, right? So set up your goals once, whether it's, you know, towards long-term retirement, whether it's, you know, towards buying a house through Read Plus, whether it's your kid's education. And after that, once, you know, you set the goal, and this is where, you know, speaking to our wealth experts and, you know, Jajun can really help. Once you set them up, at that point, we just do it for you. I'll be honest, there are instances where, I myself have not logged the Saib app, you know, for weeks at a stretch, right? Like for four, six weeks and all just maybe catch up, see what's going on. And then I just like leave the app and all that. So it's not really a setup where you've got to come in like every day and, you know, monitor and all. In fact, and I, this is something that, you know, we're, we're trying to maybe get a report out at some point, but we've actually found people who tinker a lot, they end up losing because now they're trying to time the market, right? And I think that is when you go, you know, take that 10% pot, go to a brokerage and play with, you know, GMEs and all that. Uh, but if you're looking at sustainable long-term wealth generation, this is one of those, you know, set and, you know, build up a regular habit of recurring investing. I think that's the key point. Once you have that recurring habit built into place, that's the whole thing. You put a recurring up deposit, majority of is they put a recurring deposit in their bank account and they don't even need to log on to the app. You know why? Because this recurring deposit is just automatically getting debited from the account, getting credited here. And if you need the money, one click, we'll get back to you in the next day, right? So it's very, very powerful. Um, and, and the whole point of this is that you don't have to really, really, you know, move a lot. I would suggest though that spending some time before you start your journey to see which product is better suited for you. That is where I think you should, if you know, if, if you should spend some time. But if you have a clear view, I want passive income or I just want, you know, global equity exposure, then it's relatively simple. You can choose the product for yourself and, and you know, uh, move on accordingly. Sure. Okay. So because of the time constraint, let's just take in two more questions. Huh? Okay. So the first question is with regards to the uh, cash plus portfolio, any reason why is it, uh, why, why we don't show the time weighted returns or any indicator of the returns itself? Yeah, we actually do show, do show returns out there. Right. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, mm -hmm. the, the reason with, with cash plus is that because the underlying are bonds, right? So sometimes in a very short duration, you might see a move, which is like up or down in a very, how do I say, which might make it look like, oh my God, this is down like five basis points and so on and so forth. But actually we do show returns and we do show, you know, what you've absolutely gained and you can actually quite compute the return from, from, from that perspective. Right. Uh, the reality is a lot of people also in cash plus come in and go out at a very high frequency, much higher frequency than other products, because technically it's a cash management product. So there it, you are somewhere timing the market because you're coming in today, leaving in, I don't know, two months or coming back and so on and so forth. So they're looking at that kind of return becomes very, very tricky. However, um, as we were 
we what we're telling you right that uh, both in these quarterly updates as well as you know on an ongoing basis you can see how much you've gained it's quite easy for you to actually compute what that return would be in some ways Okay, cool. Um, for the last question over here, actually, it kind of brings us back to the first slide. So um, even though, you know, we see um, the, the progress of like the pandemic itself, but also at the same time, we are also seeing uh, more variants in that sense. Yeah. So um, should clients be planning their portfolios um, against such scenarios that potentially, yeah. you know, um, another pandemic because of a variant will happen? Yeah. I think the interesting point, uh, it's a, the thing is, see, like no one can really call that off, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if anything should give us some confidence, right? And, and I'm, I'm no expert to say what this, you know, new variant will do and how impactful it can be. But if anything, I think, you know, this is as, as depressing as the last, I would say, 12, 18 months are. I think somewhere we should take a moment to even celebrate the triumph of humanity where we in a record time produced a vaccine and as you were seeing in that chart majority of the countries are anywhere between 30 to 50 percent vaccinated uh, my view is that even if some of this thing does happen will we have a correction will we have a knee-jerk reaction yes absolutely there is no doubt but given at the speed at which things have actually recovered that should give enough confidence at least for any investor in the long run you know, to stay in and that's what we say, right? I mean, your core portfolios, your core investments should always be for the long term. They should be this 20, 30% point, you know, you're buying stock, selling stock, you know, do it. You enjoy it, you know, it it, it helps you, you know, to to uh, to gamble. I mean, do it, right? I mean, I can understand the $150 fee is very high to pay if you want to go to go to MBS or Sentosa. So, so I, I get it, right? But I'm saying that if you are here for the long run, there's a potential of question that could be in ways outside the virus also, um, it should not really impact a long-term view. Uh, one of the best things I did mm. at least with my portfolio was I did nothing with it. In fact, if anything, I topped up a little bit, right? Mm. Uh, so, so, so that's how I would think about it. Yeah. yeah, and I actually think that no one can really give us an answer because yeah. if anyone could, right, then yeah. we would have expected like COVID-19 in the first place. No, absolutely, right? Yeah, I mean, if yeah. you ask people even like, you know, a year ago, what would you mm. think? We would not think we are here. Who would have told you, like, you know, I remember my equity 100 portfolio invested like a year and a day ago, it's up 32%. If you asked me a year ago, would I make 32% on a portfolio? I would say absolutely no, right? Mm. Uh, the thing is that with the with the stimulus coming in and also the, how quickly we have reacted globally to the to the pandemic, right? Uh, yeah. I think it's it's quite a feat. And I feel that if this happens again, if anything, we'll be better prepared, right? So mm, that's right. Okay, cool. I think uh, with that, we have come to um, the end of today's session. And I really hope that, you know, this session has given our viewers like, you know, another reason for the continued trust and support. So, um, and I also thought that like, you know, the little quiz um, on our Instagram yesterday was such a great testament. Yeah. And I actually had people texting me for answers, but of course I have to be fair, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you and, need to and, say you don't have yeah. any side contract, all right? You know, I'll just get get me a Mister Coconut or something on the side. Oh way. yeah, that's actually a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, and I would just say that uh, I think there are like you know a few more questions, guys. I'm sorry mm. we, we can't take all of yeah. them today, but you know, feel feel free to like you know. Uh, we will try to maybe answer some of this uh, online, but just feel free to drop an email to support at SAIF and you will hear back from us uh, within tomorrow, yeah? Yeah, yeah, cool. So um, really with that, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, a recording of this um, webinar should be uh, uploaded on our Facebook page and will be, I think. So um, yeah, so with that, um, really have a restful evening, everyone. See you. Bye, yeah, guys. Yeah, everyone. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Bye.